Good morning, guys. Welcome to this season kickoff of Vietnam Innovators. Believe it or not, it's season three of the show. Uh, thank you for joining us along this journey. It's been about a year and a half. Uh, the first episode of Vietnam Innovators was in October 2020. And the first ever guest was, if I recall correctly, the country manager of Gojek uh, Vietnam. That was just when they were rebranding from GoViet to Gojek, uh, Duc Phuong. Uh, soon after that, we had the country director of MasterCard, Winnie Wong, and so many more countless other guests over, over the course of a year and a half. I think it's been about 70 episodes on my show and about 30 or so episodes on the Vietnamese version of our show, which was hosted by our former chief operating officer, Ruby Nguyen. Uh, she's moved on to kind of host, uh, or rather start her own company called Curious. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, she's kind of run out of time to host the show. She wanted to, uh, but couldn't continue further. And so we put out a search for a new host who is really in the middle of not only innovation in Vietnam, but also business and society at large. And what better guest to invite than my good friend Miro. Uh, Miro is, is much more than just himself. Uh, he's also a partner at FPT Digital. FPT, if you guys don't know, is one of the biggest uh, companies in Vietnam. It's, it's a multi-billion dollar company. They specialize mostly in software development, uh, but have a lot of other subsidiaries from software, retail, consulting, media, so many other businesses. I think 17 in total. I can't remember exact numbers, but I'll let Miro kind of share more. But before I let Miro kind of take the stage here, we just want to share that Miro uh, is not only going to be the host for this new season of Vietnam Innovators on the Vietnamese edition, and so this show will kind of introduce him. He's also a very good dear friend of not only myself, but also Viet Cetera. Miro, welcome to the studio. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I think that um, it's a great pleasure for me to, um, to have the chance to host something like this because um, from the very beginning, knowing Vietcetra and knowing yourself, mm. I think that now uh, you were of one of the very first um, kind of the contact that I had when I came to Vietnam. So talking about a bit of myself, when how I came to Vietnam and how I came to FPT, I was born and raised in Slovakia. Um, on that time, my father, he um, somehow he uh, was one of the very few people that uh, received the scholarship to study in Czechoslovakia on mm. the time. So the whole family, we are majority of our family is still staying in Slovakia. But I decided that, um, you know, Slovakia, Europe as a whole is quite a stable countries and stable economies. And if you do, you would like to do something bigger, impactful, uh, there's not too much space for you. After having the chance and having the opportunity to come to Vietnam, so I decided that uh, let's do the big step. Everybody was against, my, my parents were, were against that. Mm. Even my, you know, a lot of friends that I asked them whether it's a good choice to move from Europe to Vietnam. Despite of that, I decided that, now, okay, I will move. So uh, I'm here in Vietnam for, for around three years. Mm -hmm. So I have um, my wife and my uh, little 14 um, month old daughter. So it's a good time. It's really, I'm enjoying my time right, mm. right now. And good, and, and you, you live in Hanoi and you work with FPT. But exactly. before coming to Vietnam, you already worked with FPT. That's right, that's yeah. right. Well, uh, the, my first contact with FPT was, before I, I joined FPT, I was working in the embassy of Vietnam. Mm. And I, on that time, I still remember 2014, I was invited together with the ambassador to join the press conference mm. where FPT announced the first kind of M&A in Europe. There I had the, the chance to meet the top leaders in FPT. And um, on that time, somehow by coincidence, my ambassador, he finished his post on that time and he was uh, post to Pakistan. So and Pakistan was not a country that, uh, that I will put on my bucket list uh, that I will work for in. You know, they, they know each other from Russia because both they studied in Russia. They somehow mm -hmm. started the, the career in mm -hmm. Russia. So had the chance to talk and, uh, you know, moving from the public sector mm -hmm. to the private sector and for the company that are large enough. And on that time, you know, um, Vietnamese in Europe, usually they work in the traditional businesses, you know, like textile, electronics, nails, restaurants, not too much in a kind of the high level, high added value mm. areas. Mm -hmm. And when the FPT came, it, they uh, acquired the company, German based company mm -hmm. in Slovakia. Mm. So you can imagine the, you know, the whole wave of the different perceptions coming in, different you know, views from the local coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to be in, in, that, um, in that kind of the space to feel how, how the people, how the, uh, even the market will react on this, right? 
And uh, it was great, a great kind of experience for me from the 2014 in Slovakia. And 2017, they decided that, okay, now let's focus on Germany. Very well developed country, the good economy. And uh, with uh, nothing in hands, I moved to Germany by the invitation that uh, kind of the opportunity to move to Germany. So mm -hmm. I spent a few years in Germany. And after that, I, I moved to FPT. So altogether, I'm with FPT for eight years. That's quite the career. And, you know, the, one of the great things about... Um, you know, being here in Vietnam and, and meeting people like you is, well, one, I think you're the only Vietnamese Slovakian person I know. Um, I mean, there's not too many of you guys, right? Not too many. There's like a few thousand maybe. Yeah. Slovakia is a very small country. Very it's small. a few million people. But then mm. even smaller is the Vietnamese community, but it's also very vibrant. Mm. So when you mentioned that FPT has an office in Slovakia mm. now, that's, that's a bit of a surprise um, in a good mm. way. I think that really shows um, Vietnamese companies are, are going global. They're out there and they're innovating, hence, mm. hence today's show. And so... You know, we're very excited to hear the kind of stories that you'll be um, interviewing on your show uh, over the coming season. I'd also love to hear about uh, your experience of working at a Vietnamese company in Europe. Like, were there mm. challenges of doing that? Did people perceive FPT in a, in a different way, good or bad? I'd just love to hear, like, what mm -hmm. those initial mm -hmm. challenges and even opportunities were. One of the very first kind of the issue, I, I could say, uh, it, when, whenever you, you come back to the history a bit, uh, Czechoslovakia and Vietnam, they were kind of the brother, they, they created the brotherhoods mm -hmm. during the time when the Czechoslovakia was socialist republic. Mm -hmm. On that time we have the, quite a big exchange in the different areas, education, so a lot of even now top leaders in the government or even the, the big companies, they studied in Czechoslovakia, in Prague or, or you know, other, other cities. After the, uh, the split of the countries in 1992, and starting from 1993, when the Czech Republic and Slovakia, they split, I can say that all the connections somehow, they disappear. Mm. And before that, you know, all the things regarding the culture, education, society was very close. So traditionally, uh, Slovakian or the Czechoslovakian, they know tradition very well the Vietnamese culture. Mm. So they have a lot of connections, a lot of kind of the friendships. Mm -hmm. But right now, after that, I think that um, we lose the momentum to keep the track. When in 2014, FPT announced the merchant acquisition, I had acquired a company there. It was the RWE IT Slovakia. It was kind of the internal department for, for the German-based company. Uh, you can imagine that uh, the Slovaks, they are working for a German company, having the good policies, good benefits. And immediately, somehow, from during the night, they changed and the owner was Vietnamese mm -hmm. corporation. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a lot of friends there as a you know, Vietnamese Slovak guy, mm -hmm. so I, I can share a, a, a lot of things with, with the colleagues. Yeah. And at that time, I was the very first and very um, uh, one, only one Vietnamese uh, full-time base in that Slovak, office. Yeah, okay. So that you can imagine how was it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I ask, right? I, I start to you know, put some, you know, create some relationship with the colleagues and uh, getting a bit of the insights from, from the people. Mm -hmm. The very first one, um, kind of the impression that I had was that right now we are working for a Vietnamese company doing the technology. So that was kind of the surprise for them. Mm. So they considered Vietnam as country develop, developing country, you know, maybe focusing on the, the really the somehow base things, mm. not the high tech. Mm. So that was the, the first kind of a surprise. So they, well, surprise is one thing, but were there doubts? Of as course, well, they're of kind of like, oh, how could they possibly add value to what we're doing now kind of thing? Yeah. If, if I will put the ratio, maybe around 70%, 75% of people, they have the doubt. Mm. But the rest, they were excited to experience something new. Okay. So they started to you know, get some information, read a bit, research, do the, some research. On that time, it still was very different because you know, if we are talking about the high-tech technology, you know, the innovation, you... You usually take U.S., mm -hmm. Germany, you know, the very developed countries, mm -hmm. but not the Vietnam, right? Mm. One of the very big concerns was, of course, they have the doubt whether the direction of the company will be still the same, mm -hmm. whether all the benefits that they have, all the, you know, policies that they were in place on the time, whether they will still be kept there and how they will change the career part of themselves. Mm -hmm. So we created many programs to, um, to attract uh, somehow the interest to, to uh, you know, experience the, the new new way of the work working and uh, we create the programs that they were able to come to Vietnam for certain uh, time mm -hmm. to experience to work and to get connections 
So some of them were very uh, happy with that, but some of them, of course, they, they have the doubts and uh, they still prefer to work with uh, under the company or mm -hmm. under the country that they consider as the, mm -hmm. the you know, the leading yeah. company. Yeah, right? yeah. So some of them had probably never even uh, been to Asia, mm -hmm. let alone That's Vietnam. Right. And um, the people at the office, they were primarily Slovaks, right? Almost 100%. 100%, 100 Slovakian. Yeah. Okay. So we have some uh, Hungarian, mm -hmm. Croatian, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that a few, few Germans, but the mm -hmm. majority were Slovak. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Vietnam, like you said, is not known for innovation, but our shows, the one, both in English and Vietnamese, is designed to showcase the innovation going on in Vietnam mm. and just how open it can be, not just from a technological point of view, but uh, the people that are here, um, you know, working within companies like FPT, et cetera, or anywhere else, which leads me to my, my next question or a bit of story, I guess you could say. For, you, for, for those of you guys that follow me or Miro on LinkedIn um, or other channels, you know, we're out there sharing, um, you know, stories and, and content all the time. And that's actually how we first met on LinkedIn. I can't remember exactly how long ago, probably about two years ago. I, I think it was around the COVID lockdown period. Mm -hmm. You know, Miro, right. you had just arrived in Vietnam. You were here for like a year probably mm. when the lockdown happened. Me, I've been in Vietnam a little bit longer, but, you know, during that time, everyone was looking for... Uh, maybe a little bit bored at home, right? That's right. <laughs> Looking that's right. for new like connections and people uh -huh. to talk to. Uh -huh. And uh, that's how we met on LinkedIn. So I remember Miro, I think Miro message, you messaged me, right, Miro? Yeah. And then uh, I was like, oh, uh, someone that works at FPT Digital as a VP or a partner or whatever your role was at the time. And I was like, oh, uh, you know, I haven't really talked to anyone at FPT, so let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. We hop on a Zoom call, you know, exchange WhatsApp messages and just start talking. I think it was like mm -hmm. maybe first call half an hour, an hour. Um, it took us a little bit longer um, to meet because you were based in Hanoi, I was based in Ho Chi Minh City. But soon after that, we we started hanging out more and uh, mostly in Saigon. And uh, fast forward to today, uh, we're chatting online all the time, talking about like what's going on, at, uh, you know, just the tech scene in Vietnam or or business in general. Um, always talking about ways to work together. Um, anyways, that's my story. Miro, what was your first impression of Vietcetera? You mentioned mm. when you moved here, it was one of the channels that you had read a little bit uh, about, you know, Vietnam before coming here. Mm -hmm. What was your first impressions of Vietcetera, um, good and bad, and, and maybe okay. like, um, yeah, maybe we'll just start there. I will link it with the, my previous story, mm -hmm. was that uh, the people in Slovakia, they were surprised whether the really, they have the doubt whether really Vietnam is innovating or the, they are innovators. Mm. Uh, when I came to Vietnam, I, I realized that the people that are really innovators. So everything was very quick, very fast, everybody in rush, right? So we, that, the, the feeling you have when you come to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. When you are in Slovakia, in Europe, in Germany, everything is stable, slow, you, you are relaxed. In Vietnam, you are quite in rush. Mm -hmm. Even you are not as a person, but the, all the surrounding is in rush, mm -hmm. right? If you come to Vietnam, you try to absorb as much as possible. For me as a Vietnamese origin guy, but I haven't spent any year as a living and working in Vietnam. So I, I tried to absorb a, a lot of information and you need to select the information, right? So you have a traditional, uh, traditional channels where you can uh, get some content, mm -hmm. but somehow appears that Vietcetra is one of the channels that they will, they're providing different content. Mm -hmm. And you know that in Vietnam is the, you need to, you have a, a huge amount of the contents coming, coming in. So now you need to select. And you need to select based on your interests, based on, you know, uh, the, the trends mm -hmm. on the market. Mm -hmm. And Vichita was a very interesting thing is a reason, few reasons. As a Vietnamese origin guy, uh, so I was somehow trying to, to put the kind of the network surround, surround myself with the people with the similar profile. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. Viet Kiều, mm -hmm. you, you leave U.S. as the, the dream country for many Vietnamese mm -hmm. and you come back to Vietnam. And you created the new media, mm -hmm. right? You know, I was interested why why you decided to do so because mm -hmm. I was I decided to leave Europe and go to go to for the same reasons, do something new and that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> I was curious and knowing uh, you know curious about your story, why you decided to do so, and what is the, the kind of the motivation behind and where the set with cetera will will uh, will move, right? And I can still remember the very first thing you mentioned on the, that Zoom call. Mm -hmm was that we would like to be the, like a Paris by night, mm. but the kind of this version, the <laughs> yeah, big yeah. one. So Paris by night, everybody knows Paris by night. My parents, they have all the, you know, uh, CDs. CDs. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, or, uh, uh, VHS still, probably. VHS, after they move to CDs, yeah, yeah, yeah. and every new CDs, when they come up, so usually we need to order, mm. right? So that was the story of the previous generation. Mm -hmm. 
So you told me that okay, now we would like to be like like uh, Paris by night. Mm -hmm. So that was also attractive enough to hear why, right? Mm. So the third reason is that really in Vietnam, if you talk about the the content, you talk about the the informations, even though we have a lot, but the quality, high quality content, you don't have too much. Mm. So I consider the Vietcetera providing quite a very structured and short that you can still read within a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to read through the book, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a few minutes to read and you get something in the morning, right? You, you get some inspiration and mm -hmm. you do the work. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason why. And I still right now, uh, more and more I'm involved with Vietcetera, even now as a, as a host yes. of the yeah. next season. I think that uh, you still keep that track that uh, you are still able to keep the interest mm -hmm. of the readers, of the, you know, the fans. So that is really, uh, really uh, exciting. To, awesome. To That's the great thing about Vietnam. I think it's very accessible. You know, mm. if, if you have your own company, you're working here, living here, whatever. Um, and it's, it's such a rich environment to, to grow and to meet people. Um, it's a huge country. Don't get me wrong. It's like 100 million people. Yeah. But it's also a kind of small in a way because people can really see if you're trying to do something, if, if you're, um, you know, goal oriented or, or just want to figure something out, you're curious. And people are very open to that, having those conversations mm -hmm. or potentially in the future doing something too. Like when Miro and I met, we didn't have anything in mind specifically, um, but look at where we are now. He's now the host of one of our shows. Mm. So um, <laughs> Miro, let's talk about your motivations for, for wanting to host next season of mm -hmm. Vietnam Innovators in Vietnamese. Um, I mean, you're meeting people all the time. Um, you're having probably too many coffees a day, you know, going around town, meeting all these awesome people. Um, why do you want to host the show? One of the very uh, big motivation is that I'm a big fan and I'm really enjoying to meet the people. Mm -hmm. Whenever we met and uh, we know each other for, for a few years already, mm -hmm. but we haven't touched any kind of the business topic. So mm -hmm. nearly we haven't talked about the business engagement between Vietcetra and FPT, for example. I, I am still watching and uh, you know, following podcasts that you are doing in English, but even after Ruby uh, started with the Vietnam, uh, kind of the Vietnam edition, I think that uh, the people that you are able to meet and the topics that you are able to explore is that uh, really exciting. You can do it within the coffee, mm. but it's amongst two. Yeah. But yeah. why don't you bring it to the, the broader audience? Mm. Because I think that, I believe that many people will be interested in that space, right? Mm -hmm. We have 100 million people, right? Yeah. So at least there will be few people that will be interested in the topic. Yeah. So I think that I consider myself, and I think that you, you as well, we have the quite interesting discussions mm. during the coffees, mm -hmm. during the lunch and dinners. So why don't we bring it to people as well, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is number one. Number two is that with the Vietcetra, you know, infrastructure that you have in hands already, uh, so you are able to also get to the people that they, they might not, uh, you know, share a lot of stories mm -hmm. uh, previously. Mm -hmm. And now through this, I think that that could be something new for them. If you talk about the traditional channels, maybe they will reject. Mm -hmm. But this is the new channel, you know, mm -hmm. this is Gen Z, this is, you know, Vietcetra, new media, new content. They will, they will consider it, mm. at least. Mm -hmm. But if you bring the traditional ones, yep. maybe they will reject it immediately. Mm. So here you still have the chance. Yeah. And we, ha we have the chance to meet people that wouldn't usually share their stories. I believe so. Yeah, I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we're looking forward to the next season of Vietnam Innovators then. I am. Um, I am very, very excited to, yeah. to uh, bring the people and bring the topics. Yeah. yeah. Who, who, are, who are some guests or, or maybe not specific, but maybe, you know, industries or topics that you want to kind of look at? I think that um, one of the very first um, first uh, guests of mine mm -hmm. uh, will be the person who is uh, very well organized and very well known in the blockchain and crypto space. Mm -hmm. uh, you read the news, you you watch the you know watch the scene in Vietnam, and the blockchain topic is one of the competitive area of Vietnam as a market mm -hmm. and for the young people as mm -hmm. a, as the people, right? Yeah. So I think that that is quite interesting topic, quite trendy right now. So that's why I would like to bring this topic to, to the people, but it will be in the way for the non-technical, uh, non-professional uh, citizen, normal people to understand what is the crypto, what is the blockchain, and how they can earn money uh, in that space, how they can leverage. Uh, I will try to get also the areas, traditional areas, but big areas enough. So meaning real estate, meaning banking and financial, mm. and also companies that they are traditional, that now they are focusing on sustainability and diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So that could be very interesting to hear and to see where the 
really Vietnam is still catching up with the trends outside of mm -hmm. outside of the country, mm -hmm. and uh, that will that will be my kind of the areas where I would like to focus. I'd also like to kind of talk about um, maybe innovation as a whole in Vietnam. You know, we're we're in pretty unique kind of positions and privileged positions where, you know, you as a partner with FPT Digital, you guys are consulting and working with these big companies, working on digital transformation projects. You get really good inside looks. You can say the same about uh, media and content uh, for us, et cetera. What, what's your kind of take on uh, Vietnam as a whole as a market in terms of is it, is it as bright as people say it is? What are some of the challenging spots that the country will go through, especially mm -hmm. after COVID? What are what are some things to look out in terms of a macro perspective mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Vietnam at the moment? I think that uh, let's uh, take a look on the, the broader picture of the economy. I think that um, if everybody knows that uh, Vietnam is doing the recovery, the whole the COVID protection and the whole COVID period was mm -hmm. uh, well managed. Uh, if we look at the future a bit and uh, kind of the forecasting from the different institutions that uh, we are reading right now, uh, we are quite bright future ahead. In regards of the innovation in Vietnam, I need to, I need to admit that uh, still there is a, a lot of opportunities that are unexplored. Mm. Traditional big corporations in Vietnam, right now the majority are owned by the owner. Mm. So meaning that they're still the founder, they are still in the executive positions. From like 10, 20 years ago. That's right. Yeah, yeah 20, yeah. 30 years. Mm. They are in that position. They are doing very well. They grew the company to, to the certain level. And now they, are, they need to do something else. And uh, we have a, a lot of different talks. And uh, right now, even we, we realize that there is a one kind of the community mm -hmm. that they are very innovative. That are the sons and the daughters of those owners. So majority, they have the chance to study abroad. So they are different mindset. They are somehow different education backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So even the, the whole environment around them is different from the parents. Mm. And now they are somehow usually coming back uh, to Vietnam and helping uh, parents to, to do, you know, run the business, family business, right? So in regards of that, innovation, we talk about in Vietnam, we talk about a lot. Everybody is talking about that. Even the government officials, they are talking, you know, digital transformation for the nation, for the government. But if you look at the practical, uh, you know, kind of the daily life, you don't see too much of that. Of course, you know, talking about is one thing, but executing is different. So I think that we will see in the coming years, we will see the huge, even bigger impacts that we are experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. So from the adoption perspective, mm -hmm. Vietnam is one of the very high, high digital uh, adoption country. Mm -hmm. So meaning that everything new you bring on the market, so usually people will try, right? So they are not... Not like in uh, other countries that they might be somehow, you know, doubting, concerning about, you know, the data, privacy and all these things. Usually in Vietnam, you everything is new, you will try. Mm. Even myself, I have a lot of different wallets, a lot of different uh, applications that mm. I will try, right? Mm. So I think the same is, is uh, for majority of Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Second is that uh, here, I, I think this very uh, coming back to the culture of Vietnamese. Mm. Vietnamese, they're usually big fighters. In a good, positive way. Right? Yeah, yeah. Always fighting, always surviving. <laughs> yeah, they can. You can put them in any place, any environment, and mm -hmm. they will survive. Mm -hmm. And see it, uh, see it from the perspective of the person Vietnamese origin living outside of Vietnam and traveling around the uh, globe. You see that every Vietnamese they will try to survive. In okay, it's an extreme uh, kind of example, but they will they will try to uh, get the money, go outside of Vietnam, and try to get a job. Uh, and after they feed the family. So that is, you know, traditional one example mm -hmm. of the story. But everywhere they go, they don't, don't know language, they don't know the culture, they even don't have the university degree. But they are still able to survive and they will still be able to, to be successful. And you see now, uh, the people that they used to do the business and run mm -hmm. the business uh, outside, they are coming back to Vietnam and mm -hmm. they are owners of the really, really big corporations in Vietnam right now. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is very much... Uh, connected with the culture of Vietnamese. I see. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, tons of startups. There's a lot of hype, good good hype too mm. around that. And then, um, you know, medium-sized companies, but the innovation will also be part from the big companies where new blood is coming in. And mm. in this generation, they're all like in their 20s, right? Maybe 30s even. They're li literally just finishing studying sometimes and, and they're kind of in training mode. 
Mm -hmm. that like usually their parents are maybe late 50s, 60s. They're approaching retirement age. They don't want to do anything too too ambitious. That's um, right. But they're they're ready to kind of pass it down to the new generation. Mm -hmm. So three to five years, maybe even now, we're, we're starting to see that. It sounds like I think that um, within uh, two three years, mm -hmm. you will see mm -hmm. because as a as a um, working in FPT, I had the chance to to meet really you know high level people, mm -hmm. uh, different areas, different industries, and I hear the stories. What I believe and what is my kind of the assumption within this year, next year, we'll see a really interesting, exciting. Uh, happenings in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So meaning from the innovation, technology, mm -hmm. new business models, mm -hmm. and even attracting and somehow connecting with the other cultures. Uh, before that, you are, you know, Vietnam is very proud to be, you know, having a lot of free trade agreements with the different countries. Mm -hmm. That is for the trade. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the innovation and technology, you don't have any kind of this kind of agreement. So now I think that we are coming to the period uh, that there will be connections for the technology transfer, for the technology corporations, mm -hmm. and that could, will be interesting to see the you know the merge of the different cultures, mm -hmm. different experience, skill sets, and uh, using Vietnam as the potentially the test country. Mm -hmm. That could be interesting. I agree, and I think you know this challenges of course, but huge opportunities. And I think it comes down to execution, right? Can we mm -hmm. can we have the people here on the ground in Vietnam um, executing on that vision and I think so. Uh, let's see how many years or take. Maybe maybe it will be tomorrow. We'll see. But that's that's also the the goal of this show, right? To kind of uncover those stories, get people to think about innovation in, in a different, new, and, and more progressive way in mm. Vietnam. So yeah, let's let's see what star stories we can unlock uh, over the next uh, few months. Um, Mira, we're we're getting close to toward the end of our show today. Um, do you have any like last comments or even questions for me about you know hosting? Yeah, yeah, of course. I, you're, of this course. is your first time hosting a show, <laughs> right? So I mean, you're always asking me how, like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I'm like, maybe let's ask the audience, right? Maybe okay. you have a question, they have some answers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll try to answer. But if you guys have any any answers too, just drop them in the comments. I think Miro would really appreciate that. All right. So okay. what what are some questions that you have? Like, hey guys, what do you want to hear about, right? And I'll, I'll tell you what I want to hear about. Okay. We'll okay. Start, we'll go with that. I think that uh, okay. So that's my turn to yeah, yeah. put some yeah, questions exactly. to you, right? I think that you are kind of the example of the story that I, I was talking about mm. the whole the whole season today. Maybe after six years mm -hmm. of kind of your journey with Vietetra, mm -hmm. what do you kind of the old, um, foresee as the in the next three years, five years? Mm -hmm. What will happen with Vietetra? What do you, what other things? What are differences mm -hmm. that you will bring on the market? Our core advantage has always been, not even advantage, but momentum, Get, getting people excited uh, from outside, inside of the company is always about innovation. And we actually recently crossed 100 full-time staff at the company. That's a lot of people. And that's not something I'm necessarily like, oh, wow, we have 100 people. You know, that's not a good or bad thing. It's just mm -hmm. more like it's a milestone in the company where you have to then invest more into process, infrastructure, you know, all these different areas that you never had to, to put investment mm -hmm. or, or time into. And I, I think that's the next stage of the company, which is how do we keep that momentum? How do we keep that innovation? Because that's what makes us exciting. Um, the bigger you get, innovation becomes slower. Everyone knows that. So everyone has to continue invest, investing in that mindset and that system. So how do we maintain that innovation? Um, we're doing a lot of things like investing in data. Um, we want to be a market leader in podcasts. Uh, we started, this podcast was the first podcast we ever did uh, about a year and a half ago. Mm. And we want to maintain that market leading position. And how are we going to do that? There's a lot of details in there that uh, I'm not going to share today, but how do we do that? That's like the end goal, you know, one of the goals. It's not even the end goal. It's just always a goal that it, it just continues to to evolve and, and always is there. How do we maintain that position? And yeah, just hiring good people and and, and keeping good people as well. Mm. That's That's definitely a challenge. Um, we have a number of staff that have been with us three, four, five years. They started as interns, their first ever job. They've been with us for five years. It's pretty amazing. One of our first employees, her name is Min. Uh, she was actually our officially, I think, our first or second full-time employee, actually. I also met her on LinkedIn, funny enough. Okay. Um, I talked about it on our five-year anniversary podcast uh, about a year ago. Um, and basically, the story was like uh, on LinkedIn, which I was browsing on. People really hate on LinkedIn. I love it. I don't know. <laughs> like people say, oh, Twitter is better. I mean, in Vietnam, at least LinkedIn is just like really strong. So yeah, That's let's right. check out LinkedIn. <laughs> but anyways, one of my contacts like liked a post that she posted about like some market research project she was doing about fashion. She was a student uh, here in Vietnam, uh, undergrad student. 
And I read the report and I was like, oh, whoever wrote this is like, you know, has for a student is actually pretty sharp, like is very okay. curious mm -hmm. and like, you know, it's it's a student's report. So it's not like an incredible like McKinsey report or something, but or, or FPT digital report, but um, pretty good. So I, I read it and I was like, I'll just message this person. I was like, hey, um, are you looking for an internship? And she's <laughs> like, yeah. So okay. we, we meet up for coffee. She buys my coffee um, <laughs> and she's just a student. And I would tell her like, hey, you know, uh, and this is when we were just two people, me and my co-founder. And I was like, hey, um, we can't pay you right now, um, but would you want to join us anyways? <laughs> and she's like, well, I make 10 million a month at Ginkgo, which is uh -huh. like the, the the gift shop you know, okay, place, yeah. mm -hmm. for, mostly for tourists. And I was like, well, stay there. Making 10 million at your age is pretty good at Ginkgo. <laughs> and then a week later, she messaged me. She's like, hey, you know, I do admit like my job's pretty sweet, but um, I like what the opportunity, et cetera, so let's just give it a try. I'm like, okay. And then a month after she joined us, um, we ended up um, paying her after a month because of the value that she was bringing to the company was just so huge. Mm -hmm. And then a couple months later, she became a full-time employee. This was while she was still studying, and it, it just kept going from there. And five years later, you know, there have been times during those five years where she's wanted to quit, she's wanted to leave, and it's up to us as, as um, people at the company to uh, continue to motivate people, show that there's a path for it. You know, career development is one thing, but also just to keep people excited, you know, okay. and mm -hmm. and we're, with her, I'm meeting her later this week, and I have to work with her and be like, hey, you know, you've done so many things in the business, uh, but how about this place? You know, we really need you here, and what do you think about that, and, and so on and so forth. You know, and she might end up leaving, which is okay. Five years at any company is a huge amount of time, mm -hmm. especially That's your right. first job, you know, like you, you kind of want to try different things a little bit, right? But it's up to us to think about Hey, bringing in new talent. How do we make sure we integrate them and and they're 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 productive, they're happy, but also for staff that have been with us for a long time. And I see it all the time, especially young talent in Vietnam. They finish uni or like you know they've tried one or two jobs. They they join another one and um, they always think it's greener on the other side, which is true. It could be, but you have to be really thoughtful about why you want to move, right? And it depends on people's age too. Maybe they they have other priorities. You, you never really know. So. It's up to us to really just sit down with people and be like, hey, you're like, so what's going on? How could we help you? And and sometimes it's just like, well, there's nothing much more else we could do. You know, it's time mm, for you to, okay. to, to go leave the home and like try something new. That's fine too. I, I'm not going to ever stop anybody. It's just like, it's just how it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that that's definitely a big thing if you had said, or just thinking about um, building a team that could last, uh, building a company that can last and is sustainable. Even for myself, it's a challenge every day to think like, oh, how am I going to motivate myself, you know, a year from now? Because things are going to change, right? Okay. Uh, so I've always got to stay, like, adaptive and uh, alert. Because if you lose your edge, then the whole company loses its edge, too. That's right. right? That's right. Especially as one of the company leaders. So that's a little bit about what we're planning. Um, what else is going on? Um, Maybe you, you share with yeah. us a bit, when we touched the topic of the, the people mm. and uh, the um, talents that you are having within the et cetera. Mm. Uh, maybe if you can share, because right now, if we see that generation Gen Z is mm -hmm. growing population, mm -hmm. a growing community, right? And there will be kind of the spenders, consumers, and they are also the contributors to the economy. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference from your perspective as a leader of, of the company? And mm -hmm. what is the difference to manage the millennials, for example, mm -hmm. in comparison with the Gen Z? What are the, the key yeah. differences? For those of you who are wondering, like, how do we define these two groups? So millennials, from what I understand, are born between 85 and 95, I think. And then Gen Z are like 95 and earlier. Something like that. Okay, let's take the, I, the group. Like basically 27 and under is Gen Z, like right now, and 27 okay. above is millennial. Mm -hmm. So I think millennials were born during and, and raised and working during a period where they had a lot of like issues like 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 I started university right when the first economic crisis hit in this 2008 2009 and people were where, where I was growing up everyone was losing their jobs like it was not a good time and then four years later the economy was really hot especially in tech uh, but then soon after that there were all these global crises um, and, and you know nowadays we have this potential war you know spreading across Europe um, uh, I won't comment on that, but uh, you know, uh, millennials have had these changes in their careers that they've had to always be more adaptive. I think Gen Z, uh, they're born and, and, and working, starting their careers during a time. Yes, there's challenges, but it's also quite, 
I think society and companies now are quite adaptive and they, they know how to work with young people. So it's maybe a little bit easier, I would say. And from my own experience, I, I see that as well. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I think millennials, they, they grew, dur- grew up during a time when they want to try new things even after a couple of years. Gen Z, especially in the context of Vietnam, they see the value a bit more than, than their other older peers now, I think, in terms of staying at companies longer. I mean, it's to be seen. Um, but the, I would say from the surveys we put out of the company, Gen Z are actually a little bit happier than millennials at all, okay. et cetera. I don't know the reasons why. It's just from what I've seen, and um, we'll see. I, I think it's also education. You know, like young people have so much better than even their peers from a few years ago in terms of like educational opportunities, job opportunities, salaries, like everything. Okay. okay. Um, mm-hmm. So it's getting better. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the last question will be also the still <clears throat> keep that community, uh, the groups mm. together, and um, maybe you could talk about innovation. We are, you know hosting the Vietnam innovators. Mm. So from the pers- your perspective and your experience, uh, is there also the difference between between those groups with, uh, in regards of the innovation? Mm. That maybe Gen Z is more innovative, yeah. maybe is not? I think Gen Z are more innovative. Yeah, I, I, and that's only because they have more tools and capabilities than even their peers a few years ago, starting their career. So we're seeing them being a bit more resourceful, a little bit more of a hustler, I guess you could say. Okay. Okay. I know people age faster nowadays. I guess like five years ago, it, it was so different. And then today, it's, 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 it's another game. So I think innovation amongst young people are definitely uh, there. I, I think, and that will, tre- that will continue to, to trend in Vietnam. I think uh, people, like you said, they have the survival, kind of always be around mentality. And I think that, despite the age group, is, is, is always applying. Mm-hmm. So okay. um, people are always on their toes kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So we'll see. I, I think, um, you know, these are good questions. I, I, I wish we had more data to kind of look at. We're actually doing a, a big kind of white paper report about Gen Z and millennials in Vietnam soon. All right. Uh-huh. Um, so, so hopefully later this year we can, we can talk more about that. Exciting yeah. to see that. Exciting to see that. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, constant, constant battle about understanding young people, right? Um, I mean, I'm 29, so I'm kind of in that group. How old are you now? I'm uh, 35. Okay, 35. Not that much older. <laughs> I think you're technically a millennial. Yes. I think that I still consider myself as a millennial. Yeah, you're, on, you're on the older side of the millennials, yeah. but you're still millennial. <laughs> cool. Well, guys, I think that wraps up today's show. Again, this is our season kickoff of season three of Vietnam Innovators. Uh, we have a number of episodes on the English and Vietnamese edition coming soon. Um, if you're watching or listening to this podcast right now, Miro show will start just around the same time um, that this episode is coming out. So look out for Miro's. If you don't uh, understand Vietnamese, uh, we do have subtitles on the video version of Miro's show in, in English. Um, and the same goes for my show. If you guys prefer to listen or read in Vietnamese on YouTube, my show will have Vietnamese subtitles. So anyways, um, that's enough for me, guys. Miro, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. We're really looking forward to the season with you hosting. Let's see what kind of guests uh, and stories we can uncover on your show. And and yeah, that's that's it for me. Thank you so much, Miro. Thank you very much, Hao. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Office House marries German quality with functional design, resulting in a future-proof concept blending sustainability, passion, and international standards. Inspired by Bauhaus design and the minimalist Office House is the modern-day answer to a burgeoning city's and Gen Z's needs. A modern, efficient, inspirational space that helps attract and retain sharp workforces while increasing productivity and efficiency, thereby reducing operational expenses. Office House, the perfect solution for your modern office needs. 